You know, usually the audience waits until after we say something to <laughs> applaud, so this is fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Andrew McAfee. I teach at the Massachusetts Inst Institute of Technology in Boston, and I have the really um, pleasant duty this afternoon of, first of all, welcoming all of you to this session uh, on gaps, on minding the gap when it comes to skills and employment. I'd like to thank you all for coming out today and being part of this. I'd also like to thank the World Economic Forum for sponsoring this event and the team here today that got us all into this room and, and, and made things um, so smoothly organized. Um, yep. <clears throat> Okay, this is the friendliest audience I've ever seen. <laughs> and I have the feeling so that... Far, I, so right. <laughs> and, and I have the feeling that all we can do is ruin things from here on in. <laughs> so we're going to leave now. Good, thank you very much. L let, me, let me explain what we're going to try to do here. I am going to spend about the first 45 minutes of our time together being selfish and asking our panelists the questions that I want to ask them. I'll introduce them in a minute. After that, we want to open it up for interaction with all of you. So as, we are, as we're talking during the first piece of time, please be thinking about the questions that you would like to ask our panelists. And if I could pose a challenge for you as you're thinking about that question, please think about how to make it as clear and as brief as possible. And please think, that how, uh, think about how to actually make it a question. <laughs> Fair enough? Um, we are streaming out live on the web. We are on, okay, so enough with the applause. This is too much. We are streaming out live on the web. We are on Swiss TV, which gives us an interesting opportunity. We are also going to be accepting questions over Twitter. So you have the option, if you'd like, ask a question and just use the hashtag open forum. If you have no idea what I just said, just raise your hand, okay? <laughs> so let me start by introducing our panelists. Uh, the gentleman next to me is Stefan Luvian, and usually when you're the moderator, you get fairly extensive notes, biographical notes about your panelists. This one just says, Prime Minister of Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to do a little bit of homework in advance. It turns out that Stefan started his career as a welder, uh, then worked as a trade union representative, and then became a politician in Sweden. Next to him is a fellow Swede, Jonas Prissig, who a year ago took over as the CEO of the Manpower Group after a long career in many countries across a couple different continents. Manpower is a very large-scale human resource company based in the United States. Um, next to Jonas is Hélène Ray, a, a economist educated in both France and America, has worked both in France and America at some fantastic institutions. And I, at the risk of embarrassing her, I need to point out that a little while back she was named the outstanding uh, European economist under the age 45. If I, if I can just interrupt the moderator right away. So I'm actually not in America, I'm at the London Business School. Oh, I'm sorry, and now, and now she's posted in London. Thank you for that. <laughs> Next to her is a um, fellow London, uh, you live in London? I live in Geneva. You live in Geneva. I'm gonna stop talking now. Uh, all, all, all next to her is someone else, I know, someone else with British experience. Guy Ryder is the Director General of the International Labor Organization, which is based in Geneva. Uh, Guy's career has been primarily working with trade unions in many different ways. And it, uh, the same is true of our final panelist, Bernadette Segol, who is the uh, elected General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation based in Belgium, who has an extensive career working uh, in the labor movement, both in different industry verticals and different geographies. So we have a wonderful mix of government, industry, and labor on the panel today, and I think we're gonna have a very lively session unless I completely fail at my job. Um, to, to get things off to a start, I want to ask each of our panelists to answer exactly the same question. And the question relates to the title of our session, which is Mind the Gap, when it comes to skills and employment. I'd like to ask each of you to talk to us about what aspect of the gap you're most focused on, you're most concerned about right now, and then very briefly, what are your proposed solutions or your favorite remedies for closing that gap for fixing the situation. Um, Stefan, can we start with you, please? 
Absolutely. First, thank you very much. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be here with you and with the, the other panelists. Can I start by just saying that, that we, we need to acknowledge and, and talk much more about gaps in general and inequality in general. We just read uh, uh, an OECD report that states very clearly that inequality is, is, uh, is an obstacle to growth and, and development and equality uh, will, uh, on the contra uh, contrary, uh, enhance growth. So equality is good in itself. That's a good starting point. Now, uh, gaps and inequalities, uh, when, I, when I think about it, uh, of two, two dimensions. First is work, to have a job as a grown-up. If you don't have a job, if you don't earn your income, that's a problem. It, it, it limits your freedom as an individual, and of course it limits your f freedom in, 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 in your life. Uh, so job is number one. And that is also why I'm focusing a lot, uh, and my government focusing a lot on not least youth unemployment, to get the young people, the young adults into a job. I've experienced myself just one month unemployment, but I can clearly remember the last week of that month was not fun. Now we have young people going unemployed for years which is a catastrophe for the individual and also for the society. So what, one thing we would do focus on uh, as an answer to a question is, is uh, get people to job, not least the young people. Make sure they have a, a promising future. So we will introduce during the mandate period something we call a 90-day guarantee, meaning that the government will guarantee any indiv every individual uh, below 25 years age uh, 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 an education, if you're unemployed, job, education, on the job practice, or a combination of that, whatever helps the individual uh, within 90 days, because we want to show the young people there is a future. The other perspective of, of gaps and inequality is, is connected to, to jobs and work, and that is education. Education will be uh, uh, even more important in, in the future. And uh, if you want to be competitive on, on innovation and good products and, and not low wages, which we do not want to compete in, that's not our segment at all. So uh, and in, in, if you want to be able to do that as a society, you must make sure that every individual gets a proper education and training. Uh, and it's also very important for the individual because that strengthens your possibilities on the labor market. We can see today, just for, to give an example, in Sweden, uh, people between 20 and 24 years of age, uh, without the secondary school, their unemployment rate is 35 percent, 35. And I, I believe that every day I say it won't get better. It will get worse. So this means that we have to allocate a lot of resources into the school at the early stages to make sure that every boy and girl reaches uh, the adult age with good competence, with good uh, uh, knowledge. So that is, uh, sorry, so that is, that is crucial. So, so work uh, and education will be the two focuses. And then um, we, the, the, the foundation for that is, is also that we need to make sure that everybody, because if we really stand up for, for the equal value, we must make sure that everybody, not just almost everybody, everybody will have, must have that chance. And to conclude, uh, no, to finally, to, to the, my final point is one of the most important perspectives right now that we have raised this morning is the gender equality perspective so that we make sure that both uh, boys and girls, uh, men and women, get the same uh, possibilities. Okay. Jonas? So uh, just before coming to Davos, I was in, in the Middle East, and I was working with a, uh, an NGO that is focused on preparing children um, for uh, the future workforce. And, and I agree with the Prime Minister. Uh, clearly, if you look at the situation in the Middle East, education is going to be very, very, very important. Uh, but of course, you know, a lot of the reasons that we have such high youth employment is that there's tremendous demographic growth in parts of the world. And every year, millions and millions of young people come onto the labor market, and there's not enough growth. 
But when you look at the individual labor markets, it's interesting, from a manpower group perspective, we, we see this across more than 80 countries, there are similarities between the evolution. And the reason there are similarities is that economies are, have cycles, economic cycles. And right now, some countries have better cycles than others. So economic cycles affect labor markets and drives better employment or worse employment. But at the same time, there are structural drivers. Technology is one, demographics is one, and they're really affecting the labor markets exactly at the same time. And as we look at labor markets and what employers are looking for, they are looking for individuals with the right skills so they are work ready, not only graduate ready, but they, they can be brought into companies. And then there are large parts of the workforce that unfortunately don't have the right skills, even when there is growth. So you can find yourself in, in paradoxical situations where you have, um, you know, employ in countries where unemployment is high and employers are saying it's difficult to find jobs. Mm -hmm. and, and that structural divide is by and large based on access to work-ready skills and that you have to have the ability to educate your workforce and prepare them. Now, of course, you would say, and ma many of you or some of you might say later on when we have the question time, yeah, but okay, so that's, that's interesting and that's a structural change and that'll take a while to evolve itself. In the short term, what is it that you can do to address this issue? And from our experience, both with employers as well as policymakers and governments, where we see that, that where we see examples of solutions that work is that you have to bring educational institutions, policymakers and governments, as well as companies together and ensure that young people as early on as possible get exposure to work life, either be it through apprenticeships or uh, as part of the uh, initiative that you refer to, Prime Minister, um, I believe is part of the youth guarantee approach in the European Union to guarantee an exposure to working life or an experience to working life so you are better prepared and you have a better understanding when growth is sufficient so that employers are, um, are, are taking action and, in, and hiring in greater numbers. Uh, so the gap that I'm very focused on personally as well as professionally is the skills gap and the importance of education and the importance of also working together in new ways because we are in a very disruptive moment where you have cycles impacting at the same time as structural changes. And we have gone through these times in the past when the steam engine, uh, engine revolution happened, a lot of people lost their jobs. And after a while, a lot of people uh, got their jobs back, but in different areas and sectors. And we believe that for, th we are exactly in this kind of moment of transition. When we come back, when we look back at this period 30 years from now, we will say this was a time of great disruption and, and uh, history will judge us on our ability to navigate this part because history also tells us that in the end, the innovation and the drive that you get from technology benefits mankind, creates more innovation, and creates a lot of growth that many people can benefit from. But we are right now at a time of great disruption and transformation and also difficult economic circumstances in many parts of the world. Thank you. Hélène? So I'm going to build exactly on what my neighbor just said. Uh, there are indeed the cyclical determinants of unemployment, so this business cycle that was just discussed. And let me just talk a little bit about, about that uh, for, for a moment about Europe. So uh, as you may know, the unemployment rate in Europe right now is still 10%, so this is a lot. In, in Spain, we are still 25% uh, unemployment. And um, I think in Europe, what we have is actually unmistakably a sign of very low, weak aggregate demand in the economy, which is driving this short-run fluctuation in unemployment on top of these long-run trends that were also alluded to by, by my neighbors. So let me expand a little bit on this short-run cyclical fluctuation in, in unemployment in, in Europe. So besides these quite dismal unemployment figures, which have been you know, with us for, for quite a while now because we have been in crisis, uh, for, for, for long, since 2009, it's a long, it's a long crisis, uh, output has been depressed, and we also see that uh, aggregate demand is very weak because we see that in the inflation numbers. You may know that uh, the euro area has been in deflation in December, and this is big news. So if you, if you have very low inflation, negative inflation, and if you have also high unemployment, that is a sign of very weak aggregate demand. So from that point of view, cyclical unemployment is, in my view, an important problem in Europe right now. So what do you do about it? 
So what do you do about it? So one of the things that needs to be done about it was um, uh, done uh, yesterday as um, Mario Draghi announced some quantitative easing uh, policies at the European Central Bank. So this is one way of, um, of trying to increase aggregate demand is via loser monetary policy. But then it cannot work by itself. It won't solve the problem in the long run by itself. You need not a new monetary policy to be loose. You also need a bit more a bit less fiscal austerity, a bit more fiscal impulse at the European Union level, a bit more sp fiscal space, investment there. And what you also need are reforms in, uh, e in Europe. So the problem with uh, you know, doing reforms, and uh, uh, so there are many examples on, on great reforms, some of them were uh, just discussed. Some of them are deflationary. So when you, you have to do reforms of the labor market, uh, in particular, you want to try to do them in environments where aggregate demand is not too depressed. And we, we have this issue right now in Europe that we, we have had various, you know, a lot of austerity in fiscal policy until recently and, and maybe still too restrictive monetary policy and uh, timid reforms. So we have, we have to get the three things together in order to get out of the, of the current issues. Now this is the cyclical part of it and then there's all the trend uh, part which have to do with uh, this fascinating data that in particular so Thomas Piketty put together. So you might have seen these uh, long run data on uh, capital uh, income ratios. So uh, the capital stock in countries was about three times income in the 1950s. It's now six times income. And if you look at uh, capital share, that is to say the share of income that goes to capital as opposed to labor, it has been trending up as well. So one way of reconciling this, this long-run trend with what is happening in, uh, in, in the technology is to say, well, what we are witnessing is indeed some kind of technological shift that makes humans more substitutable with capital. This is one way of thinking about these Piketty numbers, is to say, you know, uh, we are having technologies now that make humans uh, more similar to machine in some sense. So we can do more things with robots. We can, uh, we can do more things, uh, you know, we can have cashiers uh, which are automatized, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something that, that we are witnessing, and indeed it is, it is an interesting challenge. It is an, an important challenge. We saw technological innovation in the past. At some point, you know, there are other sectors that, that grow. So first you might see loss in jobs, but then something else springs up, innovation comes up. The steam engine was, was mentioned, it didn't lead, you know, first it led to job destruction, but then something else happened. So the question is, are we gonna see that also this time around? What, what's gonna happen? And let me leave it at that. No, give us the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is precisely a good point to discuss among all of us, and I will come back it's later. <laughs> I know, I can't wait. <laughs> Guy. Well, thanks very much. It's great to be on this panel and, and before this public. I'm not going to repeat uh, what I've heard already because I, I agree with absolutely everything that's been said. Just to make perhaps uh, four or five um, quick points. The first is we have extremely high levels of uh, unemployment in the world and the bad news is that despite um, recovery so-called taking place in growth, uh, unemployment is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, our forecasts are for increasing unemployment. Secondly, skills and skill shortages and skill gaps are a part of the reason for that unemployment, but they're only a part of, of that story. Just take an example. We've just heard about the levels of unemployment in, in Spain, and for young people it's still 50%. It's very difficult to believe that that level of unemployment is because of inadequate skills amongst young people in Spain. Firstly, because this is the best educated generation Spain has ever produced, and secondly, that those Spaniards, and there's more and more of them, who go to work in other countries, Germany for example, are finding jobs because they do have skills that are needed. So this is part of the story, but there's a lot else as we've heard from other speakers uh, uh, to the story as well. Secondly, and I concur with particularly what's been said, we know, it's a fact, that there is a significant mismatch between the skills that employers want and need and the skills that are offered by people coming on to the labour market. This mismatch is a reality, uh, and we have to do what we can to overcome it. But we have to, I think, try to work out what is behind this mm -hmm. so-called uh, mismatch. Some people say our educational systems need to be re-engineered. 
I mean, to put it in crude terms, we, we need less art historians and more engineers, more digital engineers. You can argue about that one, but it's not the whole story. Uh, we know that educational underperformance starts not at university, not at secondary school, not at primary school. It starts before kids get to school. In the developing world, you're talking about the basics of malnutrition, children growing up already uh, intellectually impaired because they don't get enough food and they don't get the right hygiene. This is demonstrated. Uh, secondly, and it relates to the growing inequality in our societies, the evidence is there. Um, at a certain level of inequality in our societies, educational performance becomes related to your social standing. And if you come from the bottom of the ladder at the beginning of your life, it's more and more difficult to climb up. So educational, access to education and skills is becoming more and more compartmented and reinforces inequality, makes the unemployment problem worse, not better. So these issues of inequality and skills, I think, come close together. I think one way forward, because and you've asked us to actually give some answers, not just lament the problems, um, is trying to tackle this mismatch by actually getting our educational systems and our, uh, uh, the actors in our um, working life closer together. And the classic formula, and I use it by way of example, is apprenticeships. Now, apprenticeships are one thing that Switzerland does really well. If you have the levels of unemployment that you have in Switzerland, a large part of that is down to the fantastic operation of the Swiss apprenticeship system. I put a child through it, it works. Uh, and other countries do the same. But when we try to generalize this experience, we run up to objections. You know, in my country, I'm British, as, uh, as you mentioned, Andy. You know, apprenticeships were something my father's generation had an opportunity for, not my generation. They've gone. And we're told it's too expensive. It's putting too big a burden on enterprises. Uh, I actually uh, saw a very interesting study in Switzerland. The average return for a three-year apprenticeship uh, in Switzerland to the company, a direct cost-benefit analysis, is a five percentage return on investment for a three-year apprenticeship, seven percent for a three-year apprenticeship, five percent uh, for a four-year apprenticeship. It makes pure cost-benefit business sense. We need to invest in uh, training, not just consider it a cost to be borne by employer or otherwise. There is a theory as well that employers are getting far too picky, uh, far too demanding, uh, that they say they go to the labor market, they don't find the exact skill sets they need, and that sometimes employers, uh, I don't think this applies in Switzerland, are less willing to take up their part of the responsibility in skill formation. They have a part of the job to do. And that leads me to my last point, which is most of us, uh, people of my age, have to get out of the idea that skills are something that you acquire at the beginning of your life. Uh, it's something you have to acquire and renew throughout your working life. And I think we have to work on the methods whereby skills are refre refreshed and replenished throughout working life. We know it's a lifelong learning process, but we have to put the mechanisms in place to live by that understanding. And Bernadette, please. Well, thank you very much. And before, uh, Speaking about uh, how to cure the gap, I mean, how big is this gap? We have very dramatic figures. Uh, just before Davos, the Oxfam uh, published a report saying that 1% of the people in the world owned 48% of global wealth. And that was up 44% since 2009. On January the 6th, the average uh, income from uh, CEOs of, of the FTSE 100, that person was getting in one day as much as the average worker in UK for the whole year. Um, we have in Greece a situation where before the crisis, one out of two people was in risk of poverty and now um, uh, sorry, one out of five people was in risk of poverty and now it's one out of two. In Spain, we have a situation where the highest income went down 1% between 2007 and 2010 
and the lowest income went down 14 percent so i think we we have to touch we have to feel how big the gap is that it's not just something intellectual it's something that is growing and it is it means also that it is taking from what is called generally the middle class um, and, and increasing the, the differences in society, which is obviously a terrible, a terrible news. Now, my second point would be why the gap? Why is this gap growing? Um, our answer is first of all that we have to look that where the gap is growing more it's in the countries where the markets are actually left very free to do what they want. And where the, the, this gap is growing less, it's when you have more collective bargaining, more social protection, more public services. And, you know, I, I, we, we have a Swedish prime minister here, and I don't think he would um, say the, the contrary. So, you know, this gap is also the result of a certain type of policies. You know, just a free market is not going to solve the problem. What is the, uh, the solution as far as the trade union is concerned? Well, there are not one solution, there are many solutions, but the first one, uh, as far as uh, we are concerned, and specifically in Europe, is just stop the austerity policies and invest for good jobs. The uh, austerity policies have driven down the wages, and um, I'm not an economist, and when uh, I hear we have a weak aggregate demand, my translation uh, as a trade unionist is to say we want higher wages. That's exactly what it means, I suppose. So we want higher wages. We want that people who are in the minimum uh, income should be able to buy more, should be able to have a decent job. What um, we want also is to have, what we have had in the last years was a weakening of the bodies, the institutions that are dealing with the social problems and, and uh, collective bargaining uh, should be developed. The, the, what has happened in, in the last years was that there was an attack on these systems. In, in Greece, for instance, in Spain, for instance, the recommendation from the EU Commission was rather to say, oh, you know, uh, get rid of this uh, nego negotiation, this is not helping the economy, and just, just uh, impose uh, your, your wages and the, the fact that the wages should be uh, going down. What we need as well, and I would like to insist on that, is a fairer uh, tax system. Uh, taxation is a very big problem. We are, uh, it is a scandal, and I really hardly ever use that word, but in that case I do. Uh, tax evasion, uh, tax avoidance, tax fraud, this is absolutely uh, unacceptable that companies would do that and would not contribute to the revenue of the country where they are producing. Uh, and the result is that uh, normal people are paying the price for that. So the, the tax question for us is taking a very, very important um, place. I would say certainly education, um, labor, active labor market policies, but to do that, and we completely agree on that, but to do that, you need public money. You can't do that if you have austerity policies. I'm not uh, going into the um, uh, quantitative easing, although our position uh, is very clear. Yes, it is a good thing, so long as the bank are not keeping the money, but they are investing in the real economy. So we are, we, we are in a position of uh, wait and see whether this is going to be um, done in the, next, uh, uh, in the next months. And of course, we, uh, we hope so. I would uh, end by saying that um, 
diminishing this gap and getting to more uh, equality is not just a moral question, it's an economic question. When you, uh, and also a political question, when you increase uh, the inequalities in the world, in a country, in the end, you will have social unrest because it is so unfair that you cannot manage a country uh, positively with uh, such conditions. So uh, that's my questions and that's my answers. Fantastic, thank you all. Uh, this is a fantastic discussion. My only problem with it is that there's far too much agreement so far. So far. So far, that is about to change with my next round of questions. And Jonas, I'm gonna start with you. You run a large and very successful company that takes advantage of um, globalization of global pools of labor, many of which are at lower wage rates, that helps large enterprises outsource their work and engage in temporary work. There's a point of view that says you're part of the problem here. Yes, no, so if, if you wanted to start the debate, uh, you know, <laughs> this is, the first thing I'll do is to disagree with some of the statements that you've made. You know, we, we are a large employer. We employ about three and a half million people every year across 82 countries, but we're a very local employer. So we're active in many different, uh, many different countries. And we act as a entry point for many, many uh, job seekers. We make the transition and the, the match between the supply of uh, people who are looking for jobs and the employers that are looking for talent that they can employ. So as that, we're, we're a very efficient mechanism to ease people into work. Um, roughly 30% of all the people that work with us are below the age of 25. More than 35% of the people that work with us were previously unemployed. And after they have worked with our organization, they are two thirds less likely to be unemployed. Why? Because they have work experience. So clearly, I see uh, our own organization, Manpower Group, as well as the industry as a whole, as a very useful mechanism to ensure fluidity between you know, people who want to get into the workforce and give employers the confidence that they can hire uh, these individuals um, and feel confident that they can then absorb them within their organization because in the end, more than 40% of the people that work with us will be employed by our client companies. So that's, that's where the... Def but so that's, that's less than the 100% that used to be employed by those client companies. Well, it is, it, is a, it is a clear competitive dynamic that companies have to adjust to changing market conditions. If you believe that companies and organizations can stay the way they are and compete the way they competed 20 years ago, you are not really understanding and seeing what companies and organizations go through. So for companies to be successful, and let's be clear, companies generate growth, and when they generate growth, they generate jobs. It is the generator of jobs. No employment growth can come without having successful organizations operating within a country, be they small, entrepreneurial, be they medium-sized, or be they big and global. Companies generate jobs and they want to be successful and when they are successful, many people can benefit from, from that success. Now, having said all of this, and Helene pointed this, this out, in Europe in particular, growth has been reasonable reasonably anemic. Although the average numbers normally don't, as with, ev as with everything, average doesn't tell you any real insight because some countries have done extremely well in the last couple of years, like the UK, Holland, and Sweden is improving uh, as well, for instance, and where some countries have had a very tough time, have done a lot of reforms, their unemployment has gone down, Spain, even Greece has had unemployment come, uh, come down from horribly high levels to still unacceptably high levels, and certainly youth employment uh, being high. So growth is a prerequisite. Uh, but it, it, a lot of the focus is to move from uh, job security to employability, because we are in a world that is very, very dynamic. And organizations have to adjust. All of you are using technology in different ways. That is driving a lot of change, both from a consumer, so from a buying behavior perspective. So some industries are having a very difficult time with the changes, and some industries are being created and being very successful. Uh, and we're, we're in a moment where a lot of new things are happening, so some things are going very well, some are not, and organizations need to be able to move and adjust their organizations
organizations to be successful. But at the same time, you have to do that, of course, in a way that, that, that helps those that are affected. And having now been in Davos for, for all of this week, I can tell you that this is something that we, as employers, are very aware of. We know that this is not somebody else's problem. We have a responsibility to participate in the solution and help lots of people along the journey because, because they need help and we have an obligation to do so. Bernadette, it looks like you wanted to react to that. Yeah, I, I did want to react because um, um, the, what we believe is that job security is not a bad word. And, and, and that the development of the type uh, of jobs where you work for a week, you work for two weeks, you have a job for a month, is not giving young people and, uh, and other people the perspective which is needed uh, for them to have a decent life. So I, we don't think that the solution for the future is just to say, you know, uh, have a precarious job. We are mm. very worried by the increase in uh, temporary agency work, which is cannot replace the normal uh, working arrangement between an employer and and uh, and the worker. Now, uh, you know, I I have had a lot of dealings with uh, employers in in uh, temporary um, uh, temporary agencies, and there is a large variety of uh, employers in this in this field. Some more serious than others, uh, but the the basic point I want to make is that. Why do we consider that job security is bad? It isn't. Job security is giving people a perspective. If you have a job for three months, are you going to buy a house? You aren't. Can you have children? Well, it's very difficult. So uh, I, I want to change the, the view that, that by uh, having, you know, saying job security is something of the past. I don't think we should go along these lines. Prime Minister. This is very important. How do we tackle the, the upturns and the downturns in the economy? It's one of the crucial things because <clears throat> we, we've had a situation for many years where, where different uh, countries, different economies uh, developed in different ways. One continent going up and the other down and on the average it was okay. But since our economies is more and more connected each other, the, these upturns and downturns will be probably bigger. So we need to address it. And, and of course, I, I believe firmly that uh, uh, we cannot have a situation where young people or, or, or older people, for that matter, more and more go into a temporary job. That temporary job is the solution, that that will be the normal thing out of two reasons. That's for the individual, but also for the economy, because you cannot contribute to the economy uh, uh, where you only, only, only have temporary job. It will be impossible. But at the same time, there, I mean, there is a, we need a discussion of how, then how do we handle it? And I think we need uh, different ways, many different ways to handle it. We need some, some part of the solution will be temporary jobs. It's not a new thing. Uh, my concern is that it will be the new normal thing, and I don't think that's any individual wants it or the economy is not benefiting. So temporary job could be one thing, but you can also negotiate uh, 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 when you when you adjust your working hours in the company. That's another solution. You can, uh, you can of course, uh, hire people. You, you just hire people, uh, and you don't, you don't, um, sorry, you, you, uh, use people from, from uh, let's say, manpower or others also as a temporary and a part of the solution, not the whole solution. Uh, and this is important because we had an example in Sweden, a, a company, SKF, a ball bearing uh, manufacturing. They discovered with only temporary jobs and sending away people, and when, when the upturn came, they, they needed the people, so they grabbed them back and then sent them away, grabbed them back. That was not a good way of doing business. So they negotiated a contract where they, they said, well, let's face it, we need to adjust the working hour just within a frame. That was good for the employees, good for the company. And we can also use training because in a downturn, we need to prepare for the upturn. 
So let's use some training during the hour. Instead of getting rid of people, we can use a part of the, to train. And in that perspective, I'm also prepared as a politician to discuss with the social partners, okay, what can we do as a society to contribute to that? So we, we can negotiate and, and agree upon on the three, the social partners with the politicians, how do we handle that situation in such a way that it's good for our companies, they can stay competitive, but also, and that is the most important thing, the people. Because what we're doing is we, we're trying to reach a development that is good for the individuals, the people. This is, this is not for, for anything else. The, the, all this is meant to be good for everybody. And that means that we make, must make sure two things. We must include the people, uh, the, the, the management of the companies, the politicians, and the employees. And we must make sure that the results of the wealth that we create also is distributed in a way that we believe is quite fair. I want to pick up on your insight that, that different countries have been experiencing pretty different trajectories. And I want to aim a question to our two representatives from labor. And I want to try to uh, inject a, a stereotypically American perspective into this discussion. Because as we look at the, and I'm going to speak as that stereotypical American, as we look at the, the countries of continental Europe, one of, and, and we're very similar societies in many ways, one of the real differences is um, what I would call the, the different preferences for, let's call them um, um, labor protective policies or, or, or very labor friendly policies. We can talk about collective bargaining, we can talk about job security. There, there are pretty sharp differences between the American approach and the continental Europe approach. So it's worth asking how are those different approaches doing? And in recent years, um, the economic growth rate in continental Europe has been quite close to zero. The productivity growth has been um, quite low in comparison to America. There's a risk of deflation happening right now in continental Europe, which would be a, a dire situation. These are not all recent phenomenon. Um, the, the GDP growth and the productivity growth predate the Great Recession. You, uh, the, the countries of continental Europe were not doing as well in those areas. And you could say that's a trade-off we're willing to make in the interest of protecting jobs and protecting wages. So how are we doing on labor? Uh, job growth has been comparatively anemic in Europe compared to America. Unemployment rates have been higher. And uh, I was just checking out the data. We've talked about the hollowing out of the middle class. That's been happening in every country in the industrialized world. So you could make an, the stereotypical American argument might be something like, um, you all are getting the worst of both worlds in continental Europe uh, because on every measure that I've mentioned so far, we're doing better in America. Could you respond to that argument? <laughs> I, I'm asking this particularly of Guy and Bernadette and then I'll go to Ellen. Let me have a go and then <laughs> you'll probably get a more intelligent answer from the next speaker. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm always, I'm, I'm quite interested by this. Who's, who's got the better system? Europe? US, US, Europe. And over the time I've been sort of vaguely engaged in that debate, the answer sort of tends to go, well, it's US. I remember a long time in the 70s, we were chasing after the US experience. Then all of a sudden, it went the other way. It felt that, well, the European model actually is working better. So this debate always takes place in a specific context, and the answers often come out in function of that specific uh, context. But just to try and be more specific uh, than that. I, I do need to press you. The numbers are not on your side well, for, the the past de for the past decent chunk of time. Well, United States, which has made a, a good recovery uh, in, in the recent couple of years. Uh, it's also had four and a half million people withdraw from the labor force. And the employment figures have to be read uh, in, that, in that understanding. Um, we've had a State of the Union address uh, just last week which I thought was quite uh, notable by its inclusion of need for a minimum wage, need for stronger trade union legislation, uh, need for better labor protection in many areas, need for child care facilities because we don't have them. Some of these things Europe scores very well upon. So let's take the wider look at the story. Uh, second point to make, you know, we tend to say the European labor market. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the state of the labor market in Sweden, or Germany, it looks an awful lot different than it does in Greece or in Spain. 
That's just a reality. It's not one country. I'm go let me jump back on that. With the exception of Germany, the numbers in Europe are largely underwhelming. The Swedish youth unemployment rate is above 25 percent, and not your good. overall unemployment rate, I just checked, is about eight and a half. Yeah, I'll be the last person to understate the extent of the employment problem okay. uh, in Europe, but they are different. And the point I'm trying to make is you can learn lessons from the differences existing between national experience. Now, when the, uh, the, the sort of the, the bolt of lightning hit from a blue sky in 2008 and economies started collapsing all over the place, Germany resisted in terms of its unemployment figures much, much better than the United States. Yes, that's you true. had an emptying out of uh, employment in the United States. For the same fall of GDP in percentage terms, Germany kept its people in work, the United States did not. These are more complex stories. Are there things in the United States you want to learn from? Yes. But there are also some value judgments that come into play about acceptable levels of inequality, about the, the extent of social protection in our societies, and these are value judgments which I don't think stand outside the hard numbers of the employment equation, but need to be factored into them. Doesn't negate the argument, but needs to be part of the argument. Bernadette, I want to, I'm, I'm sorry, Ellen, I want to bring you into this discussion. You mentioned timid reforms so far uh, in Europe in response to the crisis. In which direction do the reforms need to be less timid? In the direction of greater protection and more labor-friendly policies, or in the opposite direction? So, um, I, I think, I, first I want to emphasize one point that my neighbor made, and this is the heterogeneity of the experiences in Europe. So, if you look at the Austrian labor market, at the Swiss labor market, the German labor market, the Scandinavian labor market, it's a very different story from Greece, from Portugal, uh, from Italy, from France. Uh, so, f so, first of all, it's, it's very important to remember that. And in particular, you know, even in weak economic conditions, uh, and I've argued there is a serious aggregate demand problem, but even in weak economic conditions, there are countries which manage to deal better with youth unemployment. And these are the countries that we have already largely mentioned, uh, and, and, and I believe it's a matter of priorities, it's a matter of organization, it's a matter of less wasteful uh, use of um, training money in, in, in various countries. So there are various things here that could be done to, uh, and to and streamline maybe that. maybe if I had a lot sure. of those countries went through significant labor market reforms before the recession. Before the recession, and, and also in, in those countries in particular where vocational training actually seems to work best, there is a true discussion, freeway discussion between educational authorities, between business, and, and between, the, um, um, between the trade unions. So I, I, I didn't quite hear an answer to my question. Okay, though. no, but I'm, I'm <laughs> coming to that. I'm coming to that. So, you, 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 so indeed, so you are you are you are asking what kind of, uh, of of reforms could help, and I'm pointing out, you know, that there are countries which can do these things, and in particular, youth unemployment, which I believe is the central issue here, because it's the human fabric, because it's the future, it's uh, human capital. So we all put a high value on that. We say that, and then we see countries doing a lot more. So, so there is here, you know, we, to some extent, it's very stupid. There are some countries who would need to just look at international experience and just copy the successful ones, you know, and, um, and, and, and we would go a long way. Now, another dimension I would like to throw in the discussion, because I think it's also important, is uh, that we have to think a little bit, to frame the debate a little bit more in terms of insider and outsider in the labor market. So what do I mean by that? I mean, of course, uh, having job security is wonderful. Um, increasing wage is wonderful, uh, especially for people who have a job already. But then there are sometimes, you know, there's a labor supply and a labor demand, and there are trade-offs uh, between the people who cannot enter the labor market. So we don't have any of this. We don't have a wage. We don't have... And, and the people who are inside already and who can lobby for these things. So I think this is a dimension on which different countries make different arbitrage. So, you know, take, take my own country, France. So very often in the debate we hear, yes, it's true, we have youth unemployment, which is much worse than in Germany. But in Germany, you know, they are working poor. This is something we hear mm -hmm. in France. Or, yes, the UK is doing better on the labor market, but, you know, there are some zero-hour contracts in the UK. Now, fair points, so, but there is an arbitrage somewhere, there is a social discussion to be had, which actually we don't have very often. So I think this is, this is something that should be much more in the open. Please. Maybe, yeah, maybe just uh, 
just just a few words also on on what I just heard. Um, have the reforms worked? Um, I would say the reform work when you have a negotiation. I have seen in Spain, for instance, um, reform that have been imposed and they didn't work. They didn't, they didn't, uh, the, the country, maybe you've had uh, um, some uh, employment creation, but the, the employment creation was creating working poor. But I think, yes, in cases, in, in many cases, you need reform, you need to have discussion, but you can get through that only if you have a negotiation, if you are involving the people who are uh, concerned. And on the, on the question of insider, outsider, I know that uh, I'm speaking for trade unions here, and I am very shocked every time I hear uh, trade unions are defending those who already have a job. Well, yeah, we defend those who, we have, a, who have a job, yeah, but it is, we are also in the process of trying to find the solution for those who haven't got a job. We are constantly trying to, to find out the way out of unemployment. When we, as a trade union, we say we need a big investment plan, this big investment plan is not going to favor those who already have a job, but those who need to have a job. And um, I think we have to un underline that, because otherwise we are... Um, we are looking at organizations like ours as uh, just protecting those who are protected. And I, I just think that we have to think that you need to have democratic institutions like trade unions who are working to bridge the gap. And, uh, and, and so I, um, I, I really want to say that, yes, we need to bring in the outsiders, this can only be done through this type of uh, industrial relation uh, systems and through necessary reforms that are negotiated. I'm going to ask one last selfish question, and then let's throw it open to hear from everybody here. Um, my selfish question is about technological progress and how that's going to change the labor market. It's what I uh, study, and the, the more I study it, the more amazed I get at how fast technology is progressing. And to build on something Elaine said earlier, um, how many jobs it can do that used to belong to human beings alone. And I wanna make um, a, a set of very, very confident predictions about what's going to happen over the next not too long chunk of time, uh, with 10 years, let's say. And as I've gone around and talked to the companies who are creating the future, who, the, who are building these amazing technologies in every discipline from artificial intelligence to robotics, um, I've come up with a, with a set of predictions about the next 10 years that I, I am very, very confident in. So let me rattle off a few of those. Within 10 years, a piece of technology will be a better driver than any human being on most roads in most conditions. It will be a better pilot of every airplane in every condition. It will be able to do most of the jobs in a factory cheaper than uh, Chinese labor and probably cheaper than Bangladeshi labor. It will be the world's best medical diagnostician. It will be the world's best financial advisor. I don't think it will be the world's best novelist yet. <laughs> But I'm not sure how much, uh, if there's an entire economy's worth of demand for novelists as we move ahead. So I could continue that litany, but I, I, I hope that gives a taste of what's in store. So my question for all of you, what are the people going to be doing in the economy of 10 years from now? Maybe I'll, 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 I'll take a stab at that, and I, and I think as part of, 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 of the history, you know, this, we've lived through these times before. And, and you're describing an era, an era and a moment in time when there are many, many things changing. And it's almost hard to imagine how much they will change. But we are living through this change. And um, you know, so lots of roles, traditional roles, will no longer exist over the next 10 to 15 years. I have no doubt about that. But by the same token, I have equally no doubt about the fact that new jobs will be created. I do think that um, you know, the evidence so far shows that 
less jobs are being created uh, than are being destroyed or displaced right now. But over the long term, you know, my belief is that you will see this open up new avenues and unimagined avenues so far because the same technology that renders things more efficient and productive also is a tremendous distributor of wealth and health and opportunity. So the average age, the, 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 the lifespans of populations are increasing very rapidly. Populations are becoming more healthy. Uh, income equality has actually improved tremendously over the last 30 years. If you look at the World Bank numbers from 1990, income inequality was at 36% below this um, $1.25 measure of the world living in poverty, and in 2000, it's 14%. So there's no question that technology drives wealth, provides opportunity, but it is going to be a moment of transition. So new jobs will come up, and I believe, and we believe, at Manpower Group, that one of the things that are going to be enabled by uh, technology is entrepreneurship. So individuals being able to create their own futures, their own businesses by leveraging technology and achieving scale of economies and tapping into knowledge and infrastructures in a way that was impossible before. And, and that's what's going to, uh, that's what we believe the future is going to look like uh, a, a lot more in the future, that you will have more entrepreneurs. The world needs more entrepreneurs. They create the fastest job growth um, in, in, in economies. Um, but it is going to be a big shift. And I think that's the important thing to realize as we have our debate. Sometimes the frustration is it's built on old ideological paradigms and dogmas that are really projecting the way it was. And I look ahead and I see a future that looks nothing like the way it was. I look ahead and I see things changing and I see them changing fast. So we have to bring all social parties because certainly this is an effort that is not one person or one company or one government, this is a collective effort to be able to prepare the future in a new way because the future is going to be different than the past and it's going to change at a very uh, rapid pace. So openness to that I think is so important as we face the challenges of the future uh, because it will require new approaches and new solutions so that everybody can participate in what uh, these technological evolutions promise us. Uh, please. Yeah, so first of all, let me remind you that it's always um, very dangerous to make predictions in the technological side. So <laughs> let me uh, recall Lord Kelvin in 1895, Royal, Econ Royal Society president saying, uh, heavier than air flying machines are impossible, mm -hmm. very categorically. Yes. <laughs> So that was a mistake about underestimating that technology. <laughs> but That's not the mistake I'm trying to make. <laughs> well, well, let me let's see because you, uh, you 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 are arguing that there's a lot of substitutability with the current jobs by the robots. However, by the same argument, since we cannot predict innovation, and since if you are right, so a lot of people will be extremely interested in you know the health sector, the leisure sector. There ought to be an enormous amount of innovation coming up in those sectors, provided uh, you know there there is an issue of wealth concentration, of course. So it's actually an issue of ownership of where the, the income generated by these new technologies end up, and whether it is sufficiently spread out to generate growth in other sectors of the economy or not. So this is, I, I believe, a key issue. But uh, there are no doubt tremendous opportunities first to just do these robots, to uh, make them work, then in, in these other sectors which will doubtless, uh, in, in my view, will, will develop in the future given all the demographic trends that were, mm. that were pointed out. So I think it's very hard to make those kinds of predictions. Please. Yes, I, and I agree. <laughs> it, it's funny, I found uh, it really uh, easy now, to let make us those talk. predictions. You, you made your case, now let us talk. Yes. <laughs> no, uh, uh, no, I think it's, it's hard to, to make that kind of predictions uh, as if uh, something is inevitable. You're right, uh, definitely, there will be changes. That's all we know. Tomorrow will not be as, as today or, uh, or as yesterday. That's all we know. But of course we can cope with change, and I, uh, and I do believe that the technology development will be, be faster, that we know, uh, if we just compare to 10 years ago. So that what, what it means is that we have to also adapt and change ourselves in a faster 
pace, uh, and that is something we, we need to know. That takes training. Uh, the lifelong learning that, that Guy was talking about is very important, it's crucial. Crucial today will be even more important. So, so what, what, what it's all about is to find these new jobs. Where, where, does the, where do we allocate the, the capital in the future? But there will be new sectors, new jobs that, we, that will be uh, trained. I, I'm very sure. We, we have seen this over the years that we can say that every 50 years you have a big technolo technological shift every 50 years if you look back in the history. Now we're talking about uh, digitalization, but uh, it's only it's not that in itself right now, but it's the pace and the connecting of the different digital tools that we have. That's the difference. But, but we, we, if we just know how to, I think about the future and the history is important. It's an important perspective. But I think we have to look ahead, yes, but we have to learn also from the history. What made us strong once? And, and for example, in my country, uh, was with some very, very uh, important ingredients. Um, how do we handle a, 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 an ongoing changing labor market? For us, it meant the social partners need a, a good position. We need strong social partners. And as a prime minister, I'm very cautious to make sure we have strong employers organization. I do mean that, though I've been a trade unionist, but I, I mean it. We need strong employers organizations. We need strong trade unions because that knows, with, with those strong social partners, I know they can handle the labor market that is changing, and they can do it in a flexible way. We need education, as I talked about earlier. We need the retraining and that is something that has been lacking in Sweden. You brought up Sweden as a case, which is important to look what happened. Well, what happened was that over the eight years, uh, uh, the government, the previous government, they concentrated everything on reducing taxes, which could be good. In some cases, yes, let's be pragmatic. Sometimes it's good to reduce taxes, but it's not the only solution because it meant at the same time that the young people didn't get the training. So we have all these young people now at the labor market without the secondary graduate. They have a too bad education, and it doesn't help them if, if we, we, we can reduce taxes to zero. They won't get a job because the employers say, you don't have the proper education. So education is, is uh, definitely important, and we need the social security, and we need the innovation power to find these new jobs. How do we develop our knowledge inside here, our ideas? How do we get the entrepreneurs to develop those into new products, new services that can be sold not only in Sweden, but also in, in a growing uh, market? So now I, I agree with you, it, the change will be even faster, but I, I don't see it will end up in, in, a, in an economy where people cannot work anymore. I, I don't see that happen. Please, before you throw it open. I think it's one of your fellow Americans, Andrew, who said that predictions really are difficult, particularly about the future, and it's true. Um, you didn't mention if we can have machine prime ministers and machine economists in the future. That would be interesting. But look... Can't come soon enough. <laughs> but the point is the following. We've been here before, perhaps in our lifetime or not in our lifetime. Every time you've had a transformational uh, technological uh, revolution, uh, you, you've had this debate. Is this going to be something that is going to improve our lives, uh, make everybody potentially better off, or is it going to actually put us all in the street and in trouble? Uh, that was had in you know, the steam engine revolution, internal combustion engine, uh, the information technology. So it's this, I mean, the classic phrase is these, these gales of creative destruction. Now, is a creation going to outbalance the destruction? Uh, and I suspect it always looks more benign looking back than looking forward, because these situations, you know, by their nature, inculcate fear and worry. A couple of points. One, I think history also shows us that trying to resist technological change is something of a futile <coughs> endeavor. It won't happen even if we felt it would be easy to treat technology as our enemies. It's going to happen, perhaps with one caveat. We're going to have to guide technological applications, at least, if we are to be serious about sustainability and environmental sustainability, because technology has to guide us in, in the right direction. But in the end, it seems to me uh, that the answer to the question of whether this is going to be a win or a loss, to put it in, in, in very simple terms, depends upon our capacity 
of societal organization? Mm. Can we organize to manage technological change? Because if on the face of it, technological change is liberating. You know, who wants to work at a lousy job if a machine could do it? Who wants to dig coal out of the ground if a machine can do it? Who wants to stand on a production line if a machine can do it? Even who would want to weld if a machine can do it? Now that's the limit. That's the limit. <laughs> <laughs> but then the question is, what, are, what you just said. This liberating experience has to be cashed in to the benefit of people and our societies. To say that's impossible is wrong. To say it's a hell of a big challenge is right. And the one thing I would worry about is I think at the current state of play, uh, we're not well prepared to undertake that task of organization because, you know, the tendency is leave it to the market. Don't intervene. It'll all work out right if you leave it to the natural forces of the market and of technological uh, dynamics. And I think that's a mistake. La last word before we open it up yeah, for questions. I'm afraid, I'm afraid Guy just said what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I don't know how big it's going to be. I think there will be big changes, but my answer is don't leave it to the market. He just said it, so on. you know, that's it. <laughs> All right, let's see what we want to talk about. And please keep in mind my request slash challenge to keep it short and to make sure that it's a question. Where can we start? Let's start right here, sir. Can, um, can you please identify yourself and then talk? And, and I'll, um, do we have microphones? Please wait for a microphone. My name is Stefan Volkwein from Solar Super State Association. Question to His Excellency Mr. Löfven. Within 15 years, Germany created more than 1,500,000 new businesses by mainly decentralized photovoltaic installations. Sun shines also in Sweden. Do you think Sweden should use photovoltaics and wind power in a new and decentralized way to create more jobs and entrepreneurs? Yes. <laughs> uh, ab absolutely. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm, I'm convinced that the, the green perspective is, is the one that we should use. Uh, uh, working in, in connection with, the, with nature and the environment is the best way to go ahead. And that also uh, goes for the energy sector. And, and uh, as long as we work within the frame that the nature gives us, we have every possibility to develop new jobs. And this is the possibility to, to combine the efforts of, of, uh, of having a clean uh, environment with new jobs, new technology. What it takes in this case is not only a decentralized uh, energy production. I mean, we can build windmills and, and, and solar. We can, we can in, uh, implement solar cells, yes. What it means, though, is that we need to, ch to, to also invest a lot in, in connecting all these decentralized energy production sites. Because right now we have, in Sweden, big, we have nuclear, we have water power, these are the two major uh, providers of, of electricity. But once you go decentralizing, you must make sure that you can connect all these uh, uh, suppliers. And that's the real challenge. And I guess we have the, the same kind of challenge in, in Germany. Can we go over here with the question? Yep, you just have the microphone, but since you're right there, is there anyone nearby who would like to ask a question? <laughs> anyone. <laughs> anyone. No, no one in that part of the room is brave enough, but right down here again. Stand, stand up, please. Yep. Thank you. Oh. Does it work? Yes. My name is Sylvia Grundmann, and I would like to ask a question on behalf of all those young people here some of them sharing the accommodation where I am in. And the question is to all of you, what do you answer to a well-qualified 20 years old female student who has written 60 applications 
to get a summer internship of six weeks to work for free, and she's been turned down all the time, and she sits in front of you and she says, you're my last hope. Thank you. Anyone? <laughs> I, need, I, I think we need to challenge uh, the employers in this case, and also uh, the, the cooperation between employers, uh, uh, trade unions, with trade union functions, and, and the society. Uh, we need to engage together and, and to fully understand that uh, the young people is the future. This is a common labor force, and it is stupid not to not to use all the talent that we have. That is why we want to have a contract between the society and the, the, the business community uh, uh, to make sure that everybody gets a, a, um, a place in the labor market. And that is why we are introducing this 90-day guarantee, because I'm sure there is uh, an employer out there that wants also to take, take full advantage of, of the skill of, of the the lady, young lady that you, you referred to. And, and uh, although uh, there's another perspective which I raised in the beginning, though, that we need to look into, and that is if we know that we have structural discrimination on the labor market. I'm not sure whether that's the case, uh, what, what you're referring to, but we do have that. And that is something that we have to address to make sure that all boys and girls, men and women, have the same kind of opportunity. But I think, uh, once again, we have to decide as a community uh, whether what's the, the, what's the future. And I'm sure that we can provide, if we talk together, if we cooperate, the three partners, the society, the social partners together, we find the solutions to make sure that everybody gets a job because we need it. We need it. Let's face it, we will get an even stronger economy if everybody gets a, a chance. So, absolutely. I'm going to require at least one other response to that great and, question. And my, my response would be, we can do better. Because there, there is no doubt that you know, the, the young people of today are the ones, whether it's for you know, uh, structural reasons, that young people are excluded from easy ways of getting into the, uh, the, the workforce, or whether the companies just don't have the openings that they are needed. As organizations, as employers, we can do better in making sure that we have a closer link with those that come out of school so that they get the work experience that they need, because that may well be the issue. No work experience, hundreds of people applying to the same company, and some have work experience, be it in the summer during before, or they've been exposed to a program or training, and th th there is a competition. So you're competing with other individuals, and in some cases, a lot of individuals who want to get in to the same company and experience the same thing. Uh, so it's a very tough thing for each, each individual, and I'm sure that we can do better, both as companies as well as society at large, at facilitating uh, that process. Well, very briefly, I have been in that situation, and uh, I can tell you uh, I feel terrible when this happens, and I cannot solve all the problem on an individual basis. It's a more general question. But what I want to say is that we don't think that this free internship where young people are just uh, you know, spending a few weeks, sometimes more, and saying, oh, okay, I'm not going to take any money from your company, this is not right. We, we don't think that this, it, very often they do replace uh, normal workers and we think it is not right. So we are worried about the development of this uh, uh, internship which, is, uh, which are costing uh, zero or hardly any money to the, to the company and we are uh, doing our best uh, in fact to structure them and to, uh, to find a solution. But the, 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 generally this is the problem of unemployment of young people and unemployment of highly qualified young people. Very, very quickly, uh, and I'm not trying to escape the question, we would say no. We take internships, we refuse unpaid internships. We pay our internees as a matter of principle and we train them as a matter of principle and responsibility. But that's not really where your question is pointing. Mm. And, and I think everybody's answered the question. I think we all have to accept a collective failure <coughs> 
given the levels of uh, unemployment of young people. If you're under 25, you are three times more likely to be unemployed than another adult. That is a massive political collective failure. Uh, we seem to have put aside the notion that full employment is the basic priority of our societies. And it's, a, it, 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 it's, a, it's an absolutely essential redirection of policy that we all need to contribute. It's easy to say, it's a great deal more difficult to do. So I'm not trying to offer any easy answers, but we need to put it right top and front uh, of our objectives. And I would like Davos, uh, this World Economic Forum, to reflect that call. If someone from the WEF team has a question from Twitter, please just gesticulate wildly so I know that. Otherwise, let's go to the gentleman over there. Um. My English is not too good. Can I speak Deutsch? Sprechen is that possible? I have a more fundamental question. I'd like to extend the view on the problem here. In our society, participation is only possible if you are an entrepreneur, if you are an employer, you, if you're a selfish employer, or if you're a selfish employee. So uh, the theology of work, as it were, theology of work used to exist also in um, uh, communism, not just in capitalism. So my question would go to uh, the uh, Swedish Prime Minister. What is your take on religion and work coming from Protestantism, which was then taken up by Marxism? And are there other forms of uh, social participation? Talking about uh, the keywords of um, democracy, civic and civil activity, I think uh, theology of work is overrated. It um, leads us um, into difficulties uh, in view of the technological productivity and progress. The value of work will continue to decrease, and that is a perspective that won't lead us in the future. So let's deal with um, the theology of work, capitalism and communism. And please keep your answers under 30 seconds. <laughs> Let this, I think this is a really wonderful question. Let me rephrase it a little bit. Why are we so concerned about jobs? The future that I'm, that I'm trying to lay out for you is one of amazing abundance supplied by the machines. Why aren't we all, like, why, are we, why is, are we uniformly so concerned about jobs and work and these old fashioned notions? Well, I think. Oh, Please sorry, go. no, no, go Prime Minister, no. No, uh, no. I believe it has to do with the nature of, 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 of human beings. We want to feel that we're doing something that is, that is meaningful. We want to create. We want to build. We want to be part of something that is bigger than me, and, and that's that's the whole thing. I mean, uh, why would we bothered in, in the in the beginning if we if we weren't constructed that way? So I, I think it has to do with with the nature. And then, of course, we want to do things easier. Yes, uh, that's another thing. Even uh, welding machines, I can accept. <laughs> but 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 that's another thing. But I, I do still that we want to everybody everybody that has been out of work uh, uh, for some time feel that there is something lacking. Mm -hmm. There is something lacking. You need that, that social, uh, uh, the social uh, experience with other people and, and building a sense, something. A sense and of get dignity, that, a sense of community. Exactly. Okay. And, get, and you're doing something good and, and somebody clap your mm -hmm. shoulder and said, that's a good job. And you've, and you've you got did. a colleague. You've got somebody that you're right. interdependent with. Right. Okay. Said, but even self-employed can feel, I mean, they're also in, in some, uh, they're self-employed, but they're also a part of something that is bigger than they are contributing. So, so I, I think the, it's the human nature. Mm 
And you think it's a, it's a good and valuable part of human nature absolutely. we need to preserve. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, and I would, I would absolutely concur with that. I think the dignity of work is fundamental for you know, humans to feel that they are participating in, in, in the general growth of society. But you know, your, your point was around this binary, you know, the, the polarity of various positions, and that's <laughs> where I think there will be evolution because the traditional view is it's only this kind of work that is good, mm. and all of the rest is not good. So if you're, you're, if, if you're in this kind of situation, that's not good, that's not sustainable, but this is a perfect world. I think you will find an evolution where individuals, for personal preferences, will want to contribute in different ways, and in some kind, sometimes because of necessity that they don't have any choices yet, and then they will continue to evolve. So I believe it's not going to be a binary future. I believe it's going to be more of a scale of uh, options that individuals will hopefully have and that they will acquire the opportunity to participate in many different ways that may not be uh, traditional. So I know I didn't go into your Marxism and, uh, you know, Protestant uh, learnings question, but, you know, that is my take on what's going to happen in the labor markets. Elen, from a rational economist perspective, isn't this preference for work kind of silly? Um. I'm not a rational economist. <laughs> and I, um, I absolutely agree with, my, with what was said. I, I, too, I think we're all, sorry. I think we're all agreed. Work means something in terms of your integration in society, yep. and it also means something about self-realization, about meaningfulness. And that goes across all societies. Uh, now, the question about religions uh, and their attitude, it's very interesting. I mean, all major religions say something about work and actually value work very strongly. My dad used to say when I was at school, I was a Protestant who didn't get the work ethic because I was a very bad student. The Catholic, uh, the Catholic Church's social doctrine on work is, is very well established. Islam is a very well established doctrine on, on work. Uh, and, and you could go on. Now, the point about the future is, even if we could sort of subscribe to this notion of a machine-generated era of abundance when we can all basically stay in bed in the morning, people won't. Uh, I mean, by the way, somebody got there before you. Uh, Karl Marx talked about this stage of communism and, and utopia when he wrote Das Kapital. I got through the first 10 pages and it's all there. It's all there. But he said that people will work when they feel like it with a view to self-realization and contribution to something bigger than themselves, and, and it's interesting, which is why it is somewhat paradoxical that communism was the one atheistic society that elevated uh, work into a religion, into a false idol, you know, and uh, as, as the, the old anecdote about the Soviet trade union said, uh, yes, the way we do it is we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us, and that's how they got on. <laughs> Yeah, just, I just want to say, okay, I agree on the uh, integration through work. Uh, I think we will have to think about reduction of working time. I know it's a difficult mm. subject, but I think we will have to think about that in the future. And, and sometimes I'm puzzled, because in the uh, 18th century, the good thing was not to work. If you were rich enough, you didn't have to work, and you were perfectly integrated in society. So it's a question but I think I would need to start a thesis in philosophy to be uh, able to uh, wait, uh, answer Wait, it. you have one of those, don't uh, you? We are, but I could do it again, probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a relatively small amount of time remaining, so I'm going to um, specify that we now do a lightning round, which means the questions not only need to be short, our answers need to be quite short as well to fit in more of them. Sir? Well, before we all leave, I would like to thank you very much, this great panel. I think we all agree with me. Mm -hmm. I'm, since 1973, I'm a participant of the forum. It was the European Management Forum at this time. And it's really great to be here again. Since we appreciate that, since and now, we, now we, we appreciate that, and now we need the questions. Thank sir. you very much. No, no question oh. anymore. <laughs> wow. It was a coup. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my name is Dirk Schulte, I'm a graduate student. A short question to Mrs. Ray. Um, we were talking about the growth of capital due to technological change, and that's like a driver of inequality. 
What are, as an economist, like your advice for policies, how to counter that inequality without destroying the growth? Oh, um, that's, that's a short question. Yes. <laughs> um, no, so uh, there's a, a very long, you know, um, uh, economic literature about how to design fiscal system in order to, uh, to keep incentives for growth. Uh, and to, to have and, and also taking into account uh, fairness. So uh, I cannot go into details there, but uh, uh, unfortunately, so, so what I can say is that so the new data that we have, largely put together around Thomas Piketty and his co authors, Emmanuel Saez, etc., do point to a very important uh, divergence both in, uh, in wealth and in income in a number of countries. Again, this is uh, heterogeneous. And uh, w uh, you, you could say to a point where indeed uh, an inequality, you know, may be detrimental to economic growth. And uh, if this is the case, then uh, you have various ways of uh, going about it. Uh, the proposal of, uh, of, of Piketty, as you may know, is a global wealth tax, which seems to be a bit of a utopian thing uh, in the current state of, of, of issues. Um, as was mentioned before, I be, you know, these, these issues about inequality have to be tackled on a global basis. This is something I, I believe, at least for European level or, or, or more, because you need cooperation if you're going to crack down on uh, tax evasion, if you're going to crack, if you're going to impose any taxation on something which is mobile, uh, you're not going to be able to do it alone. So uh, the first thing to try to, to reach there is a kind of consensus and, 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 and to move the agenda forward. Now, uh, you know, then at which level, this is really a, uh, another debate. Okay, five minutes left, everyone. Uh, can we go in the back? We have some hands up and toward more of the back. Um, we are at the World Economic Forum, and I would really like to know what you think about all that you discussed about the technical evolution and everything in respect of the global um, and globalization. And if this n is not a question, maybe Mr. McAfee, you could turn that into a question. <laughs> Why, why are we all, this, this is such a, a rich world, Western European um, panel. Can any of you talk at all about the rest of the darn world where most people live? <laughs> we, <laughs> well, I'll try. Um, <laughs> uh, first thing to say is the world doesn't look the same everywhere as it looks in Europe. That, that really is true. One of the good things in what is a pretty alarming sort of scenario for, men, for many respects is, guess what? The global middle class is getting bigger and bigger mm. and bigger. Uh, in the developing world, 34% uh, of jobs, 34% of jobs uh, give what we um, calculate to be a middle class standard of living. Okay, it's modest, but it's there. Uh, and it's growing very quickly. It's growing very quickly. So that is quite interesting, I, I think, as a, uh, as, as a reflection on our overall circumstances. The other thing I think, uh, I mean, all these debates that take place in the forum, you get a more of a bewildered sort of feel at the end of it. There are so many different things going on. Um, you know, there are regional processes out there, some of which are very worrying. We talked about security, what's going on in the Middle East. There's an awful lot of conflict, open, violent conflict going on in the world. Sometimes it gets nearer to Western Europe. You see what's going on in the Ukraine. Sometimes you have terrible incidents, such as in Paris a couple of weeks ago. But this is day-to-day -day experience for much of the world. There's a great deal of conflict out there, and I think that needs to concentrate our minds as we deal with all the things here. One thing I can tell you, based on my experiences on a lot of, in a lot of different sessions here at the forum, if this panel were composed of Asians and Africans, it would have an unbelievably optimistic tone to it. Mm. Next question, please. Yes. Uh, we go over there, sir. Yep. Yeah, uh, Volker Graf, as a physicist, I want to say, don't wait for the future, create it. And I'm saying so because it's clear that innovation and technology is the main driver for new jobs and so on. And those will create wealth accumulation and w what you have to create the future is how to redistribute. This. And now comes the question. And the question is, uh, 
this is so key for the stability of the society that uh, there should be focused on. Uh, maybe evolutionary way how to re uh, redistribute everything. Thank you. I'm not really sure. What's the right redistribution policy going forward? Taxation, working time, wages, <laughs> market forces. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're the tiebreaker. <laughs> we need a mix. <laughs> no, 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 and this is serious. So we, we, need, we, need, we need a market-driven economy. I, I'm, I'm convinced of that. We need the market to, if, I mean, we've tried the, the, other, uh, the other alternative in the eastern part of Europe. It wasn't successful. Mm -hmm. So we know that. But we need pre-distribution and redistribution. Pre-distribution is giving everybody a proper education, everybody a job. But redistribution is also important because we, know we want a welfare system, at least in, in Sweden, a welfare system, a social security, that, that not only is helping the individual that needs it for the moment, it is helping the whole economy. And that is a, the, the, the genius thing with, with social security, that you, you, you benefit from it as an individual when you need it. But the surrounding environment knows that he or she, although she is unemployed or he is unemployed or sick, will still be able to take part in the economy and, 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 and consume. So, so those are uh, very important ingredients. We need pre-distribution and redistribution. And those are good words to end on. Thank you all for coming out and thank you to the panelists for doing such a great job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 Thank you.